So we're going to be in 1 Corinthians chapter 8 today. Uh, we're going to do the whole chapter. So we started it last week. We're going to kind of review um, a little bit from the, the first couple of verses, and then we're going to go through the whole thing because it's all one connected thought. So we're at the point in our letter that Paul wrote to the church in Corinth where he's sort of shifted gears. He began the letter in a very traditional way, and then he, he began by addressing some things in the church that were happening that he didn't think should happen. And so he was, he was kind of correcting them. He was setting some things out, saying, hey, listen, stop doing this, stop doing that. I don't think you should do that well. Make sure you've thought through that. And then he, he shifts tone, and, and there's a, a whole segment of this letter where he's just answering the questions that they had sent to him, And so he just kind of goes through them in sort of this bullet point list where he says, okay, well now, now about this question that you ask, and he gives a response. Now about this question that you ask, and he gives a response. And so we're in that, that section where Paul's teaching them via the questions that they asked. And so this was a, a question and answer session, and uh, this was ask the apostle is what this was. Um. When I was uh, pastoring, I pastored in Illinois for just a little bit, and uh, there was a, a, a local television broadcast. It was a Christian station, and they had Ask the Pastor. And so you could go to Ask the Pastor, and uh, they invited local pastors, and then the local people would call in their questions, and they would just kind of pick one of us on the panel, and we would answer the questions. And it was always not enough phone calls. It's just how it always went. So I had a buddy that would call in and disguise his voice. He might have been like four or five of the calls that night. He'd just change his voice every time, just to ask us questions so that we had things to talk about, right? And then it got picked up by DirecTV and went national, and, that, and they had to turn people away. There's just way too many people. It was a lot just to, hey, hey, you've got about 10 seconds to answer this question. And you're like, well, I can't explain the deep theological contradictions of the Church of Rome versus the, the, the Anglican split in 10 seconds? Why are you asking me that? So it's just kind of that thing. This was where we get this model was the Corinthian church was asking the apostle. They just written questions to the apostle and he's just answering the questions. And so this is, uh, this is what is taking place. Now, some of these questions, what we found is he answers the question. They ask the question, he's like, yeah, okay, I think you need to do this. But then some of them, like what we see in chapter 8, they ask a question, and Paul's able to discern, okay, here's your question. Your question was, can we eat meat that's been offered to idols? That's the question. But there's this underlying something that needs to be answered before we can really address that issue. There's a question behind the question. There's this, this theme that you need to know. There's something that you've got to have as a foundation. And then with that as your foundation, then we can actually talk about the issue that you asked. And so he's giving them this, this underlying foundation. That's how he starts chapter 8. And then the rest of chapter 8 and even all of chapter 9 and even all of chapter 10, he's kind of circling this underlying theme from different angles and applying it to different aspects of their life. And so it's, it's, it's like they asked a question. He said, thank you for that question. I'm actually going to talk about this over here first. And then from this, once we have this as our foundation, everything else that we talk about for these three chapters is going to have this theme of this is how this knowledge applies to that. And here's the knowledge that he was wanting them to have. The question behind the question was, does our knowledge impact our love? And, and what he's trying to communicate is, yes, we have knowledge. Yes, we know things. Yes, we're learning. Yes, we're gaining knowledge of each other and of God and of our community and how we reach them effectively. We've got this knowledge. But love has to be what overwhelmingly is communicated in spite of the knowledge that we have. So we might gain the knowledge that if you're worshiping an idol, that's a false god, and if that's all you do, you're not going to spend eternity with Jesus. We might have that knowledge, but how we position that has to be wrapped in love. 
We might have the knowledge that for me something to do is really okay. The Bible doesn't say it's wrong. It's a matter of conscience. It's really okay. But if someone else communicates, hey, that, I think that is wrong, then the way that I present the knowledge that I have has to be wrapped in love. And so this is the underlying theme, and we're going to see this as he applies it to all kinds of different topics from chapters 8, 9, and 10. So this is an important thing for us to remember. The knowledge that we have and the way we communicate the knowledge by, by which we live should reveal both our love for God and our love for people. So again, a little bit of historical setting before we read this chapter. Uh, Corinth was full of idol worship. There were idol temples, and it wasn't just the, the temple, right? There's a lot of churches that are open for church services and closed for everything else. And so you only go to the church for church, but that's not how it was in those days. They had the temples, and in the temples, there were meat markets, there were restaurants. In one temple, it worked like a mall. It's where the public baths were if you wanted to go get clean. Uh, there was a, a, a pottery factory that was a part built into the temple. There's all sorts of different things. And so you would go to the temple, not just to go to the temple. You might not even believe in that God. That might not be your God of choice, but you would still go to that temple because it was where the meat market was on your way home. And so they, the, the question was, can we eat that meat? I mean, that, that animal has been sacrificed to an idol is it okay for us to eat that meat? Because you got people that are being saved out of idol worship that are saying, you know what they've done with that meat? One third of that animal was offered as, an, as a worship to an idol. How can you go support that? And so there's a lot of confusion that was circling around this. And Paul's saying, listen, I get the context. I get the confusion. I get the frustration. So we're going to step back away from that topic for just a minute. And the first thing we're going to do is say, there is a way that you can love God. God, and there is a way that you can love people, and it doesn't matter what knowledge you have about what happens or what doesn't happen, you can love God and you can love people, and the knowledge that you have should be wrapped in love. And so this is the, the launch pad for everything else that, that Paul talks about. So stand with me. Uh, this chapter is only 13 verses. We're going to actually read the entire chapter today. And we're going to look at what it means and how it applies. We're going to start in verse 1, and we'll read all 13 verses together. So, so read along with me. It says, Now, about food sacrificed to idols, we know that we all possess knowledge, but knowledge puffs up while love builds up. Those who think they know something do not yet know as they ought to know. But whoever loves God is known by God. So then, about eating food sacrificed to idols. We know that an idol is nothing at all in the world and that there is no God but one. For even if there are so-called gods, whether in heaven or on earth, as indeed there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is but one God, the Father, from whom all things come, came, and for whom we live. And there is but one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom all things came, and through whom we live. But not everyone possesses this knowledge. Some people are still so accustomed to idols that when they eat sacrificial food, they think of it as having been sacrificed to a god, and since their conscience is weak, it is defiled. But food does not bring us near to God. We are no worse if we do not eat and no better if we do. Be careful, however, that the exercise of your rights does not become a stumbling block to the weak. For if someone with a weak conscience sees you with all your knowledge eating in an idol's temple, won't that person be emboldened to eat what is sacrificed to idols? So this weak brother or sister for whom Christ died is destroyed by your knowledge. When you sin against them in this way, you wound their weak conscience. You sin against Christ. Therefore, if what I eat causes my brother or sister to fall into sin, I will never eat meat again 
so that I will not cause them to fall. Amen. You guys may be seated. So there's a lot taking place here. Really the main thing about what Paul is doing here is he's encouraging us to be people who are considerate of other people. There are a lot of different topics that Paul covers, especially since he authored two-thirds of the words in the New Testament. So he, he covers a lot of ground, but in that there's some themes of his that are consistent to the way that he presents his message. And one of those consistent themes is the newness that happens to us when we commit our lives to Jesus. The old is gone, the new has come. He talks about being a new creature. He talks about renewing our minds, having a new mind. He even uses uh, terminologies like once or before or used to. And then he contrasts them with but now. And so this is a constant theme that Paul has through his writings. And, And this is in keeping with that theme. You used to not care about anyone except yourself and that was fine. But now, because of the work of Jesus in you, as a, as a product of the work of Jesus, as someone who is committed to the work of Christ, to being a follower of Jesus, now you have to be someone who doesn't just think about themselves. You have to be someone who thinks about others. And so this is a, a theme that he uses, and we actually see this same theme pop up. He refines it, makes it a little more clear for us in the book of Philippians chapter 2. I want to read those first four verses to you. He says this to the church in Philippi, therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, this is what he's talking about. Once you were not united with Christ, before you were opposed to Christ, but now you are united with Christ, and if there's any encouragement from that, if there's any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of mind. That's a tall order. Then he says this, do nothing, this is how, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather in humility, value others above yourselves. Not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of the others. So in both of these passages, in the, in the church in Corinth and the church in Philippi, what he's doing is he's saying, listen, if your knowledge is going to be wrapped in love, the way that that looks is that you're not just looking out for your own interest. The way that looks is you don't just operate in what you know and you don't care about how it impacts anyone else. There has to be some forethought given to the things you say, the things that you do, and what we're supposed to be thinking about is how will this impact the people around me? We're all connected. We're all one body. And what happens is I've got 10 fingers and I can interlock these fingers and those fingers remain individual. But if, if I take one of those fingers and I start pressing up against the outside of my hand, eventually it's going to cause some of the other fingers to start to move because of the way the joints are connected. And this is how it is in the body of Christ. If one member suddenly starts getting pressed, the other members feel that. And what Paul is saying is, listen, you might have freedom. You might have knowledge. You might know better. But if you just act in that and it's not wrapped in love, then the way that comes across to someone else is going to be potentially damaging and may may actually cause them to fall back into sin. And the reason they're in sin, of course, they have their own choices that they they made, but but the reason that they made, you helped them make their choice to sin. And so he's saying we can't do that. We have to give thought to the way that we communicate. We have to give thought to the things that we do, the things that we say. We have to give thought. And the thought that we give is, am I taking the knowledge that I have and am I wrapping it in love? Then he does this um, in this instance by addressing a specific topic about idols. Now this is interesting. If I tell you that this is the God of the stools. Every other stool worships this stool. It's got four legs. It spins. You can raise it. You can lower it. 
It's what makes it the God of the stools. It's not just one fixed height. It's adjustable. And if I were to tell you that because this is the God of the stools, you too can worship the God of the stools, does it actually make this a God? If you worship it, it does. You can make it a God in your life, but it doesn't change the fact that it's not a God. What if we build an, a, an elaborate temple for the God of the stools and people from all over begin to journey to the temple of the God of the stools and we have a, a restaurant and a coffee shop and it's super cool and we've got music playing all the time. It's got a good vibe, awesome couches, best cappuccino. And we make it a thing. Is it a God? To you it can be. But in reality, just a stool, it's nothing. And this is what Paul was, was sort of combating. So you've got these two groups of people in the church in Corinth. And the, and the groups of people are those who were saved out of idol worship and those that didn't worship the idols. And so you've got the people coming out of idol worship and saying, but that's a God. That was sacrificed to Apollos, and Apollos is this God. And you got the people that haven't worshipped Apollos going, Apollos? You mean that rock that Jim Bob carved the other day? It's not a God, bro. That's a rock. Jim Bob's not even good. Look at the face. It's all weird looking. And you got the other guy going, no, that is a God. That was sacrificed and worshiped to a God. And everyone's going, that's not a God. And you've got, this is, this is the rub. And here's what Paul's saying. Hey, you can make that a God to you. And there's all kinds of things that we do make gods to us. And, and what Paul is doing is he's saying, listen, when you make something a God to you that is not a God, it, what it does, when you recognize something as a God that's not a God, there's a kind of person that it makes you, and the kind of person it makes you, he's teaching us from the negative, is not the kind of person you want to be. Now, this is a, a, a tactic of teaching that a lot of the apostles would use. They would kind of change it up. So sometimes they're teaching from the positive, and they're like, be like Jesus, and that's a positive thing, right? And then sometimes they're like, don't be like that guy, and they're teaching us from the negative. And this is one of those times where he's, he's teaching us from the negative. He's saying, listen, there is something that you can do that's going to make you a kind of person that you don't want to be kind of person that you don't want to be if you are a Christ follower is someone with weak faith. So here's the first kind of person we don't want to be. We're going to see it from both sides. The first kind of person we don't want to be, don't be people who are weak. What, what makes me a weak person because listen, the last thing I want you to do is to think this is some sort of a you can earn this on your own, just go out there and do better kind of thing. Because that is not the gospel. The real gospel is you will try and you will fail. And then you will learn that you can't do it on your own and that you need someone to save you and Jesus is that savior. That's the real gospel. And then even when you're empowered by the Holy Spirit, you're going to have these moments of failure because you still are fully carnal. You're not God. And then there's grace. And then you're going to have these, these parts of your life that are a continual frustration to you and things that you wish you could change, but you're, you just really struggle in. And that's why his mercies are new every morning. And on repeat, the presentation of the gospel is you can't do this on your own. So when I say, don't be people who are weak, I don't want you to hear me as if I'm saying, just get out there and do better. Buck up, buckaroo. You got this? Because that's not the gospel. What makes a person have weak conscience? What makes a person weak in this sense, the way that we're talking about it? Well, the, what makes a person weak is the recognition of non-gods as gods in their life. That's what makes them weak. So there are, um, I mean, an idol is easy to pick on because it's literally stone, 
right? But we can make things gods in our own lives that aren't physical stone. We can idolize different things. Here's, here's, I want us to shift our understanding of what an idol is. Because when we hear idol, we think of a golden object or a stone object or something that other people worship. Right? But worship is just setting your heart's affection on something. That's what worship is. So an idol is anything on which we set the affections of our heart when, when the affections of our heart should be set on God and God alone. And if we're truly committed to Jesus, if we're truly saying, no, he is the only God, this is the God that I serve, then everything else is a non-God. And I won't even recognize it as a God. I won't make it a God of my life because there is no other God but him. And it changes our focus on things. You want some real world? Real world, I'll say that correctly. You want some real world examples? There are people that their heart's affections are on politics. And their savior is either the guy in the office or the guy they want in the office. And the guy that is in the office or the guy that you want in the office, depending on your political persuasion, may genuinely be a good guy. With the front runners right now, probably not. But maybe. I don't know them personally. But probably not. But they might be. Maybe. I don't know. They might be great guys. But you know what they are? Terrible gods. And if that is your heart's affection, if you're, if you're pursuing that instead of pursuing God, then that has become a God to you. Now, is it possible to pursue God and be political? I think so. In fact, I think we need more of those kinds. But it, it can't be your heart's affection. You, you want something that's a little more difficult? For a lot of pastors, their heart's affection is their church and not their savior. They get so focused on numbers and they get so focused on, um, on response, they get so addicted to the attaboys and the great job pastors that that's really the craving of their heart's desire. And this is what it does. When your heart's affections are set towards something that is not Jesus, it shifts the way that you look at it. So instead of the pastor looking at, at the people as humans with souls who, who need leadership in Jesus, what they do is they start looking at people as tools to use to achieve my objectives. And they start viewing everything that they do through the eyes of marketing. And they start trying to market Jesus. If our heart is right, then our view is right. There are families. Uh, ready for this? Because here I go. There are families that the way they view youth athletics is overly anti-gospel. And if your kid's soccer team is your God, that's a bad God because they don't even win every time. Like at least God wins every time. But, but if, you're, if your heart is right before the Lord and he has the affection and he alone has the affections of your heart, well then youth athletics is just something that we do that's fun for them and it teaches them some positive things and it doesn't become my God. And you know what? I'm not gonna travel to Chicago if I can't afford to travel to Chicago. I'm not gonna put a third mortgage on my house so that my kid can go play in Kentucky. Why? 
because I view it through the proper eyes of Jesus. And youth athletics is great, but it's a bad God. For some people, where, their, where the affections of their heart is, it's on achievement. It's on the, the accumulation of stuff. It's on material goods. It's on wealth. They don't feel like they've achieved anything unless they think their bank account outranks all the other bank accounts around them. And that's where their heart's affections are. And so they, they begin to cut corners. They, they begin to change their heart towards certain things. And they change their hearts. Why? Because that's where their affection is. When your affections are on anything other than our Savior, it changes the way that you view those things. And it changes the way that you live your life based on how you view those things. Now, if our heart's affections are on Jesus and he's bringing multiplication of our finances, is that wrong? No. But what it does when our affection is on Jesus is we literally look at resources as tools and we don't view them as our ultimate objective. We could go on and on and on and on and on. In Joshua chapter 24, this one won't be on our screens. Uh, on Joshua chapter 24, what's happened is um, there's a, a moment in Joshua's career as the leader of all of Israel where, where he's, he's been victorious in battle. People have their, their homes. And so what happened is Moses led the people out of, out of Egypt in slavery and bondage. God did miraculous work to free them and he brings them into the promised land. And what happens is on their way there, some people are like, hey, this is good land. This kind of suits us with our style of living. Can we have this? And they're like, sure. So this becomes your promised land. And then we cross the river and we go in and we conquer these people. We're like, hey, tribe, this is now your promised land. And then we keep going and we're doing more battle and we're conquering more people. And now this is your promised land. And then we go up here and we're like, hey, you, you're, you're kind of tribe. You kind of do two things. You, you get a half here and a half here because you kind of do two different things. And so they go through this whole allotment and the people that they're conquering, some of them are completely destroyed. Most of them were not, even though they were commanded to be. And so the ones that they're coming into, they're, they're now farming fields that they didn't plant. They destroy the cities, they conquer the people, and they're like, oh, I mean, there's a bunch of grapes out here. Let's just go harvest those grapes and eat those. They're living in houses that they didn't build. They're, they're occupying places of business that they didn't construct. And so they're just moving in. And there are places of worship that don't reflect the God that they serve. And so this is a lengthy period of time where the army is conquering here and conquering here and conquering here and conquering here. And then when they all get everything together, Joshua pulls everything up. And what's happened is through that lengthy period of time, the people have kind of wandered away from God. And they found these idols and they found these other non-gods and they started making them gods in their life even though they weren't. And so he pulls them all back together. And he goes through everything. So when anyone starts talking about Israel and the nation of Israel in the Bible, even throughout the New Testament, they start with Father Abraham because he had many sons. I am one of them, and so are you. And so that's where they start, right? Not Joshua, not in this moment. Joshua says, hey, Abraham's dad like, he goes one step further. Abraham's dad, he lived on the other side of the Euphrates, and he was a pagan. That dude was not a good guy. They worshiped idols, the, the idols of the gods of that region. He was engrossed in that. And from this idol worship, God took Abraham and rescued him out of that idol mentality and revealed himself to Abraham. And because of that, we now have all of us. And then he goes through all the times when God was faithful, even though we are not faithful. And then he ends with this sort of this, this apex of moment when he says, listen, we're going to draw land, a, a line in the sand, and here's what we're going to do. Choose who you're going to serve. Do you want to serve the God of your fathers? 
that the father of Abraham served before God revealed himself? Is that what you want to do? And the lands where you live, you want to serve their gods, the people that you conquered, who, who our God showed himself to be stronger than their God by, by completely destroying them on your behalf. Do you want to serve their gods now instead of the God that rescued you? Choose who you will serve. That's what he says. And they had options. He gave them all the options. And he said, for me and my house, I'm going to serve the Lord. And the people responded, no, we're going to serve the Lord too. And Joshua said, no, you won't. Here's the thing. You won't. And it won't go well for you because God is holy and he's jealous and you are rebellious people and you will not do this and it won't go well. And they're like, no, man, we talk about. We're totally in. So he forms this new covenant with the people of Israel, warning them that, hey, if you don't serve God, if you set your affections on other things, it will not go well. And this is not doomsday. This is the grace of Jesus for us. This is not God as some... I don't know, needy junior high girl that's like, you have to sit by me in every class. Go adjust your schedule. <laughs> this is God in his loving kindness saying, listen, because I love you, when your heart starts to wonder, I will bring it back. And the way that I bring it back, you might not like, but that's my loving kindness to you. And I will bring it back. And the people of Israel in that moment were like, we'll sign up for that. We can see that yes, we will probably fail. Yes, the affections of our heart will wander. And yes, when it does, we want God to bring us back, regardless of how bad it feels. That's what they signed up for. See, where it starts to get a little tricky is it's one thing to say, this is the stool God, and we can all look at that and be like, well, that's dumb. But what about the spiritual war that's taking place in our society? What about the actual realities that there is a demonic realm? And what about the realities that the demonic realm does have some limited power that's been granted them for this time by the ultimate authority, which is God? And what about the fact that they can trick people by doing some weird things? And that people can start to get sucked into, oh, they'll give me their power. I can operate with their power. You know, the same temptations were made with Jesus. It says the Holy Spirit led him out into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Here's what I love. To be tempted by the devil that he created as an angel. It's his own creation. He was tempted by the devil. And the devil tempted him in three different recorded ways. It doesn't mean those were the only temptations because the Bible says he was tempted in every way just as we are yet was without sin. But there were three that were recorded in Scripture. And one of those was unlimited cosmic power. As he showed him all the kingdoms of the earth, he said, I will give this to you. Well, it wasn't his to give. And the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. So what was being offered was some sort of a, a counterfeit. And that's the same thing that, that the demonic realm offers us today. They offer us a counterfeit. They offer us something that will not end well. They offer us a, 
It's a temp- the reason it's a temptation is because it can be alluring and attractive, but what it leads to is death. And that's the Bible. There is a way, the Bible says, there is a way that seems right to a man or a woman. That's an all-inclusive, uh, non-gender specific term for humanity. There is a way that seems right to humans, but in the end it leads to death. And, and what the demonic wants is to invite you onto the path that leads to death. And the Bible says broad is that road. And many travel down it. But it says narrow is the road that leads to life. And only a few find that. And we want to walk on that narrow road that leads to life. And the way that we do that is we disallow the non-gods. Now, you ready to get really weirded out? Paul's talking to Christians. So how does this look in the church? Because he's not talking to non-Christians. He's not talking to idol worshipers. He's talking, to, he's talking to Christ followers, people who have committed their lives to Jesus, who are still struggling with their heart's affections not being on him. How does it look in the church? Well, you got the folk that are like, there's a demon under every rock. The, the, we had microphone issues last week. That battery demon got us. Zapped that battery right out from under us. You know, it's spiritual. It changes the way that they live. It changes the way that they see the world. It changes the way that they pray. It changes the way that they speak. Let's let's talk about this. When you pray, if you spend more time talking to the demons than you spend talking to the creator of all things, probably your heart's affection is wrong. If you think it's your authority instead of his authority, your affection is wrong. You're craving power is what you're craving. You're not craving the Savior. This is what it is. Oh, but he gives us authority. Mm. No. It's his authority. And the Bible says that when we humble ourselves in his presence, that he will use us and things will happen, but it's not because of us. It's because of his authority. So our role is not to show up and be like, the authority has arrived. Our role is to show up in humility and say, Jesus, will you do what we can't? And in that humility, we can believe God for big things. And we can see God do the miraculous. And it has nothing to do with us because he could have done it whether we were there or not. When we make something a God that is not a God, we have weak faith. Strong faith says, that's a stool. Only God is Jesus. Weak faith says, no, I can serve Jesus and still have the affections of my heart on all these other things. No, I can serve Jesus when really the affection of my heart is my friends. I can serve Jesus when the affections of my heart are on my pastime. No, I, I, can, I can serve Jesus when the affections of my heart are on my addiction. No, I can serve Jesus when the affections of my heart are on um, the accumulation of things. No, I, I can serve Jesus when the affections of my heart are my, the, the witchcraft and the demonic and the pursuing all these different knowledges that we can try to gain. No, I, I, can, I can serve Jesus and... Can I tell you, if there's really no other God but him, there's no and. It's not Jesus and. It's Jesus 
alone. If you want an A word to follow Jesus, it's alone. We are saved by faith alone, through grace alone, by Jesus alone. And there is nothing else that should hold the affections of our hearts. And when they do, we are people who are weak. Now what's the other side of this? The other side of this is people who are people who wound. You've got people who are weak and you've got people who wound. Actually, I want to read us this one. Um, this is in verses 9 through 12. This is the warning that he gives. Be careful, however, that the exercise of your rights does not become a stumbling block to the weak. Leave it there for a second. The, the, the word exercise and rights, are, it's actually the same word twice in the Greek. It can be translated as rights. It can be translated as freedoms, permissions. Um, so, so what he's saying is, be careful that the right of your rights, be careful that the permission of your permissions, that the freedom of your freedoms, that's what he's saying. Be careful that the freedom of your freedoms does not become a stumbling block to the weak. So we've, we've got the weak, the people who are acknowledging things as God that aren't God, and they're trying to, to harbor their affections for non-gods and their affections for the God. That's the weak. And then you've got the other people who they're just going to wound those people. And he's saying, listen, you, you might have some permissions, you might have some freedoms, you might have some knowledge, you might know that that's a stool and not a God. But if I walk around saying, hey, anyone, I'm not going to get a t-shirt that says, if you worship the stool, you're an idiot. And yet with our attitudes and with our hearts and with our speech and with our social media, a lot of times what we as a church, not we as a church, we as the community of church, What we communicate to the world is, if you don't serve our God, you're an idiot. And he's saying, listen, you've got to be careful that the freedoms that you have, that they don't become a stumbling block. Verse 10, he says, For if someone with a weak conscience sees you with all your knowledge eating in an idol's temple, won't that person be emboldened to eat what is sacrificed to idols? Here's what they're saying. Someone, if they think you're this great Christian and they see you doing something that they know in their hearts as sin, whether it may or may not be, it's a matter of conscience. So if they see that as, oh, well, they're doing something as sin, then what's going to happen is they're going to say, well, why do I even need to grow? What's that pastor talking about? Talking about discipleship and all that stuff. What's the point of that? I'm just barely saved. I, I live like they do. I've always lived like they do. I've been, I've been going to that temple diner my whole life. Well, they still go to the temple diner. Why do I even need to go to church? Why do I need to read my Bible? Why do I need to pray? Why should I worship? What's wrong with the kind of music that I listen to? What's wrong with the drugs that I'm doing? What's wrong with the lifestyle that I live? What's wrong with the decisions that I make? And it can lead them away from Jesus instead of pointing them faithfully to Jesus. Verse 11, he says, So this weak brother or sister from whom Christ died is destroyed by your knowledge. When you sin against them in this way and wound their weak conscience, you sin against Christ. So we have people who are weak and we have people who wound and the people who wound, the, there's those, those Christians who, who they don't give any thought to, is there a way that I could communicate the knowledge that I have wrapped in love in a way that will draw people in and point them to Jesus? And the reason they don't think that way is because they don't love that way. Because the affections of their hearts are on something different. And when the affections of our heart are on Christ and Christ alone, then he does something in us and we love that way. And when we love that way, we automatically act in ways that reveal that love. And then the knowledge that we have is being communicated through love. 
and is being communicated by, through love because we have love, and we have love, the Bible says, because he first loved us. Sometimes the knowledge that we have is spoken in love as we disciple and help grow. And sometimes that knowledge is suppressed in love as we allow our lifestyle and the fruit of our walk with Jesus to do the speaking for us. Sometimes God wants us to be vocal. Sometimes God wants us to just be And if our heart's affections are on him, he'll help us discern the difference. Here's the, here's the thing. The root for being people who are weak or being people who wound is the same. It's the same problem. It can manifest in different ways. We can either see it through weakness or we can see it through wounding, but it's the same problem. And here's the problem, the pursuit of self. If I'm someone that the Bible says has a weak conscience because I'm making something a God that's not a God, what I'm really doing is I'm making a God what I want to be a God. I'm pursuing myself. If I want to have this status, then that's what, I, that's what I pursue. If I want to do this activity, that's what I pursue. If I want my kids to be the greatest quarterback since Joe Montana. It's already been done. His name's Tom Brady. It's what I want. That's what leads me to being a person of weak conscience is there's not been a surrender of self to the Savior. I may have asked him to be my Savior, but I've not made him my Lord. When he's my Lord, he's my all, he's everything, and I just do what he wants me to do, and pleasing him is my chief pursuit. If I'm someone who wounds, the other side of the coin, it's the same coin. If I'm someone who wounds, I'm just pursuing myself. Well, I'm going to do this and I'm going to say this because I know what is right. And I know what, what the next thing should be done is. I, I know how to do this. And this is what I want. And I want to be free to go eat in whatever temple diner I want. And I don't want you telling me I shouldn't. When if he is my chief pursuit, then then the humility that Christ wrapped himself in, when the Bible says he did not perceive equality with God as something to be grasped, but he humbled himself, making himself a man so that he could die in our place. That level of humility is like a cloak that I wear. When he is my chief pursuit, I can see the world differently. I don't see it through the eyes of self. I see it through his eyes. And when I see the world through his eyes, I don't show up and say, it's my way or nothing else. Even though, listen, the Bible's pretty clear. There's only one way to the Father, and that's by Jesus. There's only one name by which men are saved. One name, and that's Jesus. It's not the name of a political candidate. It's not the name of, a, of the local demon God. It's not the name of a youth sports team. It's not the name of wealth or wealth management. It's not the name of whatever your God is. It's Jesus. Jesus. And when I know that, and I really honestly live that, then I don't have to show up and wound people, just like I don't have to show up and be weak. 
the knowledge that I have will be wrapped in love and that, that loving knowledge will prevent me from adopting something as a non-God, as a God in my life, and it will prevent me from wounding anyone else who has done that. So when you go to lunch with someone today, the topic of conversation should not be, do you know what I think your God is? Been looking for an opportunity to talk to you about this one. It's not the topic of conversation. There's humility and there's love. And it might be confession. The conversation might be, man, you know what? I've made my God. You know what's stolen the affections of my heart? But there's knowledge wrapped in love. And that keeps us being the people that God wants us to be. Will you stand with me? Listen, for, for some people here, I think that today for you needs to be a line in the sand moment. Here's what I think you should do. I think you should go read Joshua chapter 24, all of it. And I don't think you should wait. I think you should do it before you turn on the television. And when you get to the point where Joshua says, choose you this day whom you will serve, I think there's got to be a decision. You can keep languishing in the same problems that you face time after time, day after day, season after season, or you can just simply make a choice to stop it. This is what Joshua says, depending on the translation that you read. He says, in the ESV, he says, put them away forever. Put your, put your idols away. Put the non-gods away forever. If you're reading it in the New National Version, it says, destroy them. Destroy the non-God. Here's why. You've got to know that when I make Jesus my Lord, I don't go back to anything else. He is my Lord, he is my Savior, and he will be my chief pursuit. And for some of you, there has to be a time. Stop dallying. Stop trying to have a foot in both camps. Stop trying to serve both. Whatever it is that you're serving, quit it. Listen to the admonishment of Joshua when he says, make a choice and then stop. Put them away, destroy them, turn away from them, and don't go back. And then I think there's more people in here. I think there's probably more people in this group. And none of this is in my notes, so you can be mad at me and email me later. I think there's probably more people in this, in this group that you've got people you need to go apologize to because you're people who wound. And you don't give consideration to others. You, you, you read Philippians chapter two and that lifestyle is foreign to you. It may be attractive, but it's foreign And, and listen, I'm not, I'm not being funny. I'm being serious. What God is speaking to your heart right now is stop being a jerk. Stop being a jerk. Surrender your life to him and don't be a jerk. Exhibit the loving kindness that he wants you to exhibit. And don't be people who wound. Don't be people who are weak. Don't be people who are wound, who wound. Let's pray. Jesus, we thank you for your goodness to us. Thank you for the way that you love us and lavish that love on us. God, I pray that as we've opened your word today and, and seen the things that you say to us in Corinthians chapter 8, 
In Joshua chapter 24, God, it's Philippians chapter 2, it's amazing how these trends are all throughout the Bible that you want us to be a certain kind of person. And it's the, the only way we can accomplish that is by surrendering our lives to you and allowing you to shape us into that. So God, we humble ourselves in your presence. God, we, we ask that you would forgive us for making things gods that aren't gods. We ask that you would forgive us for allowing the affections of our heart to wander away from you and to set those affections on other things. God, help us to have you as our chief pursuit. God, forgive us if we're people with weak conscience, with weak faith. Forgive us if we're people who wound. And God, help us. I pray, God, that you would change the way that we see the world because you have changed our heart. We invite you to do that, and we humble ourselves in your presence. We ask for your help. In Jesus' name, amen.